Thank you. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, well, first of all, the reason why I'm here is because I met Martin in a conference in London, <laughs> and we chatted, and then he told me about J Prime, and we, then we talked over the months, and then finally I'm here, so thanks for the invitation. My name is Meta Tamel. I am a developer advocate at Google. I'm based in London. And today I'm going to talk about Gemini and, and how to use Gemini. Uh, one second, my screen <laughs> went black. <laughs> yeah, the, ah, there we go. Okay. Yeah, so I want to talk about how to use Gemini from Java using Langchain for J. If you're careful, you'll realize that I sneaked in Gemma in here as well. Um, Gemma is the open source version of Gemini. It's an open source LLM. And since this is a Java conference, I thought it was relevant to have an open source LLM as well. So we're going to be talking about Gemini initially. And then towards the end, I'm going to also introduce Gemma. Because if you want to run your own LLMs for testing, or, 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 if, or if you don't want to rely on a cloud provider to run your LLM, you can still do it with Gemma. So that's what I'm going to talk about as well. Um, if you want the slides, it's already on my speaker deck, so you can get it from this link. Um, and the demos I'm going to show, they are actually part of a workshop, and we also, we also have this hands-on workshop that you can, all, you can after the, today, you can go and check it out yourself as well. And I'm going to share all the links at the end of the presentation as well. So anything I show today and talk about is already available to you, and it will be available after my talk. All right, so what I'm going to do is that first I'm going to introduce GenAI briefly, and then I'm going to introduce uh, Gemini briefly. So it will be like 10 minutes of like setting the stage. And then after that, I'm going to go through some code examples. And so it's going to be like fast running of code examples on how you can talk to Gemini from Java using Langchain for J. Then we'll get into some more complicated examples with RAG and function calling and multifunction calling, and then um, using Gemma, using test containers, and Olama. So there's a lot of stuff to go through. But hopefully, at the end of the presentation, uh, you will have a good idea of how to use this stuff and what, what it kind of looks like, OK? All right. Uh, so let's start with the landscape. So first, I want to make sure that you understand where we are. So what we are talking about today is this little part, the LLMs, OK? But it's part of a bigger field, right? So we have artificial intelligence at the top. Then underneath, we have machine learning, which is a part of artificial intelligence. Then there's different types of machine learning. But we, here, when we talk about LLMs, we are talking about deep learning machine learning. Uh, OK, so that's like a subfield of machine learning. Then we have generative AI, which is deep learning that generates stuff like text or image or audio or video or whatever, right? So that's the generative AI field of deep learning. And underneath, we have LLMs. That's usually um, given text. It gives you text back. But nowadays, now they do even more than that. And we'll talk about that. And we also have image generators. Um, given text, it gives you images. Or given text, you, you have video. So there's a whole field under here. So there's a lot of stuff uh, under artificial intelligence. So I'm not going to talk about 95% of it. I'm going to talk about just the LLMs part of that. Okay? So it's good to understand where we are. Now, when you look at Google's research and DeepMind uh, in terms of our innovations, actually, there's been a lot of stuff happening since, 19, uh, since 2017, 18, 19, so on and so forth. And I'm not going to go through every single paper and every single project that we had, uh, because it's kind of irrelevant for application developers. You know, it's for machine learning uh, or data scientists. Um, and for application developers, they're not really relevant. What became relevant was basically back in 2022 with OpenAI uh, and then with afterwards with Google Palm. Um, and then afterwards, we, have, we had Gemini. So that's when GenAI became relevant for us. So we started with Palm. Then we had Palm 2 in 2023. And now we have Gemini. That's the latest and greatest model from Google Cloud. And that's what I'm going to talk about. But just know that this stuff, even though it looks like it's new things for application developers, there's been a lot of stuff happening since 2015 um, in this area. And when you look at LLMs, there's a lot of LLMs out there nowadays. Some are closed source, like Gemini. Some of them are open source, like Gemma. Um, they are from different companies. Um, so it's actually quite hard to keep up with what's happening. 
And if you go to this website, lifearchitect.ai.models, they do a good job of kind of summarizing what's out there, how big are they, uh, what they do, stuff like that. So check that out. This is the latest I had from March. There's probably a newer version recently. But if you look at it, like Palm 2 was the model that Google released with uh, 3, 340 billion parameters. Then Gemini Pro came along, which is less, but then Gemini Ultra has 1.5 trillion, so that's a lot. GPT-4 is 1.76. So you can get a sense of like, what's out there and how big are they. And you know, we, at this point, you might be wondering, like, why, why does it matter like, how big it is? Well, because with larger models emerge n new capabilities. So the, more, the bigger the parameter size is, then you get more reasoning uh, with those um, models. And you can go to this link and read more about that, why, why that's the case. So that's the AI landscape. But if we bring it back to Google, this is how the Google AI landscape looks like. Um, and in the hardware, that is, there's Gemini, the model, OK? Uh, but there's a few different ways of using Gemini from Google. Uh, the first way is through Google Cloud. And in Google Cloud, there's uh, something called Vertex AI, which is the AI platform of Google Cloud. And within Vertex AI, there's something called Model Garden, which is a place where we host a number of models. So some of these models are like Palm or Gemini from Google. But other models are Gemma, open source model, or Llama, or Cloud, or, or others, right? So anything that you can um, run yourself, we try to host them on Google Model Garden so that you can run them in Google Cloud if you want to. Of course, we also have special, specialized uh, models like Kodi for code generation, ImageGen for image generation. And then there's also other things, like models is one part of the equation, but then you also need um, vector search, you, have, you need vector databases, you need a lot of other stuff on top of the models, right? So that's what Vertex AI is about. Models plus all the other things that you need on top of the models. So that's Google Cloud. But then there's something called Google AI Studio, which is a playground for trying Gemini, basically. So it's an easy way of trying out Gemini with an API key and see how it performs. So you can use Gemini either from Google Cloud or from Google AI Studio. Normally, people will start with Google AI Studio because it's the easiest way to get started with Gemini. But then if you're building an application, you probably want to be in Google Cloud because it gives you not only the Gemini model, it gives you access to other models, and on top it gives you all the tools and, and databases and everything else you need on top of the models, okay? So that's the Gemini model part, but Gemini is also a brand. So everything that uses Gemini under the covers, they kind of get rebranded with Gemini. Uh, for example, there's something called Gemini app, which is the chat app to talk to Gemini, kind of like ChatGBT, for, but for Gemini. There's Gemini Cloud Assist for cloud customers to get, get um, help about configuring cloud, running cl cloud applications, stuff like that. There's Gemini Code Assist, which is kind of like co-pilot for, for Gemini. So there's a lot of Gemini stuff on top of the model itself. So there's the Gemini brand, uh, but there's also the Gemini model. Now again, today we are mostly focusing on the Gemini model, but just know that if you hear the word Gemini, it might mean the model, but it also might mean the things that use the model, okay? So we, we need to be clear about that. So yeah, so we are talking about the model today. And when you look at Gemini model, it has three available sizes. So the, there's the size of Nano, which is for devices. Uh, there is the size of Ultra, which is the high, biggest and most capable version of Gemini. And there's the Gemini Pro, which is kind of in the middle uh, that most people will use, uh, which is the mid-sized model of Gemini. So normally, uh, what I would say is that if you are running on a device, you would use the Nano. If you are running a service, you would use probably Pro. But if you want the latest and the greatest and the biggest model, then you would use the Ultra. And the unique thing about Gemini is that it's natively multimodal. What that means is that it not only understands text, but it can understand images, it can understand videos, it can understand sound. And it's, it can respond back with those as well. So it's multimodal. It has sophisticated reasoning, and we'll see some examples of that. 
and it's also pretty good with coding. So if you want to ask any kind of coding questions, um, it can generate code, it can understand code, it can give you hints about the code, and that's why we have Gemini Code Assist to help you with your coding kind of tasks. And there's a version of Gemini, uh, Gemini 1.5, um, which is um, the high context version of Gemini. So normally, most of the models, they have a limited context size, but Gemini 1.5, it has a context size of 1 million, uh, and it will soon increase to other, more than 1 million. But what this means is that you can send it like, uh, you can send it uh, one hour of video or 11 hours of audio or 30,000 lines of code in one request, and Gemini will understand and make, a, make sense of that. Uh, so that big context size makes a difference if you want to do things like video summarization uh, or audio summarization, stuff like that. And last but not least, there is an even a newer version of Gemini 1.5 called Gemini 1.5 Flash. This was just announced at I.O. And this is basically Gemini 1.5 when you need speed and efficiency. So if you want quick answers, then you would use 1.5 Flash. It's still multimodal. It still has long context window, but it's much faster. Uh, and I actually just updated all the samples that I'm going to show you from Gemini 1.5 to Flash. And they just work. It's basically the same thing, except it's just much faster. It responds faster. Um, so if you need that kind of speed and efficiency, that's, that's what you would use, Gemini 1.5 Flash. And lastly, um, so all, all of this is like Gemini, Google stuff, uh, and you, you need to be using either Google uh, AI or Google Cloud to access it. But if you want to use open source uh, stuff, and if you want to run them yourself, you can use Gemma. So Gemma is the open source version of Gemini. It's derived from Gemini, but it's not as powerful as Gemini. But it, it can still work in some use cases. And um, you can run it locally. You can run it on Kubernetes. You can run it anywhere, basically. Um, so it's for people to experiment with a large language model locally or on-prem. And if, if you don't want to rely on Google for, for large language mod models, then Gemma is the answer uh, for you. And I'm going to show one example of this at the end of my talk today. And the difference between Gemini and Gemma is that you know Gemini is closed, Gemma is open, Gemini is very large, Gemma is smaller, um, Gemini is multimodal, Gemma is right now text only um, and English only. And then there's small, smaller differences like you know Gemini supports function calling, Gemma doesn't. So it's a slimmed down version of Gemini basically. Now, over time, of course, I'm expecting that Gemma will get better and it will probably get closer to Gemini, but at the same time, Gemini will get also better in other ways. So it will always be like Gemini will be the thing that's the latest and the greatest, but Gemma will be the open source version, that slimmed down version of that for people who want to experiment, research, and run, run locally. Okay? All right, so that was a really quick overview of what Google offers for LLMs and what Gemini is and all that kind of stuff. But now I want to talk about actual code and show you some examples. Um, and the first thing to clarify is that when you are using large language models, you, you always get the impression that, you know, I need to know Python now. I need to switch from Java to Python because it's, everything is in Python. But that's not the case, actually. Uh, there's quite good support for Java developers nowadays, and I want to show you some examples of that. First of all, on Google Cloud, um, on Gemini, um, you have two options. If you are a Java developer, number one, you can use Gemini SDK. So we actually have a SDK dedicated for Java developers for Gemini. You can add your dependency, and then all you need to do is just create this Vertex AI class, and then create a generative model, point to the model, and then after that, you just say generate content, and you will have response from the LLM. So it's very easy to use. So that's option one. And the option two is to use Langchain. Uh, Langchain, it's an uh, open source large language model framework. It started in Python. Now they have Python and JavaScript versions. And they also have a Java version called Langchain for J. Um, and the good thing about Langchain is that um, they really have good abstractions like document loaders, text splitters, app parsers, stuff like that, that you usually need with all large language models. Okay. And with that, um, 
you can learn Langchain, Langchain and you can talk to different models. Like you can talk to Gemini, you can talk to OpenAI, you can talk to different models. So that's why I kind of prefer to use Langchain, because you'll learn one library and use that library to talk to different models using common building blocks that they that give you. Okay? So that's what, what, that's what I will show you. But just know that every single LLM, they have their own library, so you can use that library if you like. But I prefer to use Langchain because it's the kind of the high-level library that I can use for multiple large language models. All right, um, and the demos I'm going to show, they're part of a code lab at this link. Um, so if you are curious after this talk, feel free to, ch to check this link, and everything is explained there, and you can run them yourself there as well. Okay? So let's actually take a look at some examples. So what I want to do is, so this is the code lab that I'm talking about. So let's just actually take a look at uh, some examples. Like the, so first one is, let's say, how do you actually talk to Gemini? What's the simplest hello world? Okay. First, um, I, I'm using Langchain, as I mentioned. Um, and then in Langchain, you create a um, chat model. In this case, we are talking to Vertex AI, so that's why I'm saying Vertex AI Gemini chat model. So I have a builder that I need to point to my Google Cloud project, that I need to point to my location, because Gemini has different endpoints in different parts of the world, so you need to point to whatever endpoint you want to use. And then you also need to point out the model name that you want to use. So in this case, I'm using uh, Gemini 1.5 Flash. And then once you have this chat language model, then all you need to do is just say model.generate and ask something. So in this case, I'm asking why is the sky blue, and I'll get a response from the model. So let's actually run this. Um, so I will go back to my IDE, and then this is the first one. So question and answer, I'm using Gradle to run it. So now we'll run it, and if internet works, we'll get a response from Gemini, why, is it, why the sky is blue, and then, yeah, the answer is here, right? So we made a request. I mean, this was quite fast because we are using Flash, and I, I told you the Flash is the fastest uh, model right now. But if you are not using Flash, you would wait a little bit for the answer, and then it will come back with the answer. Now, this is one way of doing it. Another way is to get responses in streaming. Let's say you are working on a chat application, and you want to make sure that you get responses from the LLM as fast as possible. You can also stream the responses. And the way that looks is that um, I will show you the code here. Uh, so instead of creating a regular chat model, you use streaming chat model, and you still point to your project and location and, and your model. And then when you do model generate and ask the question, you need to provide a streaming response handler. So in here, you're basically getting streaming responses. So you have this um, on next and on error handlers. And then as responses become available, you will just keep printing them basically, right? So that's how you can do streaming. Uh, so if we run this, so this is the same, same kind of uh, sample, but streaming, you will realize that the response will be streamed. So if we see it, um, hopefully, it will be like a streaming responses, right? So you will get responses in a streaming kind of way. This is useful if your LLM is going to give you a lot of text and you want to display them as they come in. And you can do that way. Okay, that's good. Um, so what else we can do? Um, now, you, if you want to chat with the LLM, so talk to the LLM and like have a conversation, you actually need to set the context and send the context all the time because LLMs, they don't have a state, right? So LLMs, they don't keep track of the state. So if you want to have a conversation, you need to kind of maintain the conversation and you need to send that conversation to the LLM every single time. Thankfully, Langchain makes this easier. So they have this uh, concept called chat memory and you, by using this memory, you can actually just use that and let Langchain handle that conversation for you. So the way this works is that you still create a chat language model, and then you create this chat memory. So in this case, I'm using a chat memory in, in memory chat, and I'm specifying max messages 20. So what I'm saying here is that I want to keep track of the latest 20 messages in my chat, and then I want to send these messages to, to LLM every time I ask something so that the LLM has the context of my conversation. And then in, um, in Langchain, you usually define an interface for your application. So in this case, our interface is a conversation service that has a chat 
message that you pass in a message, you, you get a message back. But this is an interface that you can define on your own, depending on your application. And then you use AI Services Builder to kind of b bring everything together. So I'm using AI Services Builder. I am pointing to my conversation interface. Then I'm pointing to my model. Then I'm pointing to my memory that I created, the in-memory. And then I do a build. And with that, I have this conversation service. And then from then on, I can just use this conversation service to talk to my LLM. So here, what I'm doing is that I'm coming up with a list of questions. And then I'm going to just say conversation.chat. So I'm just making a call to my conversation interface, basically, and saying, OK, this is my message. What's the response? This is my message. What's the response? And the key thing here is that the questions that we are asking is that hello is my first question. Then the LLM will respond. The second one is, what's the country where the Eiffel Tower is situated? And then the LLM will respond with France. And then I will ask the, how many inhabitants are there in that country, right? So if this works, then the LLM should know that we are talking about France, right? Uh, so that's, that will be the test for us. Does the LLM remember the fact that we are talking about France, right? Um, so let's run this. Um, I will go back here. Um, this is the conversation. So I just let's run this one. And now we say user hello. Then we are waiting for LLM. The LLM says, hello, what can I do for you today? Then I say, what is the country where your effort tower is situated? Then it, Gemini tells me it's France. And then I ask, how many inhabitants are there in that country? And Gemini tells me, according to the latest estimates, France has a population of 67 million. So it remembers the fact that it was France. So the fact that um, I think the fact that you need to tell LLM your whole context every single time is annoying. But at least Langchain makes it easy by having these constructs where you can just say, OK, just remember the last 20, and then send, and it will send it for us automatically. So we don't have to worry about that ourselves. All right, so that's chat. Um, but as I mentioned, L, um, Gemini is multimodal. So it understands images and, and videos and text and stuff like that. So for example, if we have this image, can we ask Gemini something about this image? And the answer is yes. Um, how do we do that? Well, first, I have my image URL. So it's just a, uh, it's just a public image. Then I create my chat, chat language model. So just like before, there's nothing different. But the message that I'm sending, the prompt I'm sending, it can include text and also other things. So in this case, I'm including uh, text uh, that says describe this picture. But I'm also including the URL of the image. right? And with that, I get a response from Gemini. And we'll see what it says. So we'll see if it's going to um, recognize the image or not. So I'll run this multimodal. So we run this, and then I'm saying describe this picture, and it will go and get the picture, and it will describe it for us. But you will see that basically it's multimodal. It will understand uh, images. Uh, you can send uh, sound files. You can send videos. If you use a Gemini 1.5, you can say, here's a video or, or a one hour, or maybe this talk, and it will do a summarization for you, stuff like that. So as you see here, it says it's a cat with yellow eyes, stands in the snow. The cat is looking at the camera, so on and so forth. So that's pretty cool. All right, uh, what else do we have? Um, so the good thing about LLMs is that you can use them for many different things. So you can use them to answer questions. You can use them to describe images. Another thing you can do is to extract data. So most of the time, we have text, some text that has some information. And from that text, we want to extract some data, um, what, I, what I call structured data, right? Let's say you want to have a class out of that text, or you want to have some kind of table out of the text. So you can basically extract any kind of structure from text uh, using LLMs. So in this case, um, let's say you have this text. So this free text about a person. So Anna is a 23-year-old artist based in Brooklyn, New York. She was born and raised in the suburbs of Chicago, so on and so forth. So you have this text. Let's imagine you want to extract some information about this person, the name of the person and the age of the person, right? You can use LLM to do that. And, and Langchain makes this actually quite, quite nice. So what you can do is that first you define 
what you want to extract. So here we are creating a record with the person, name, and, and age. Then you define an interface, um, person extractor. And in this interface, you tag parts of it. So here we have what's called a user message. Okay? And in this user message, we are basically giving a prompt to the LLM and telling LLM how do you extract information um, and giving instructions on how to do that. So here we are saying that extract the name and age of the person described below, return a JSON document with name and age property, and make sure that it follows the structure, name and age. Okay? So we are giving some instructions, and then here we're going to pass in the actual text that we want to extract the information from. So once we have this user mes message, we also have this interface that takes a text and returns a person, so a strongly typed object. So once we define that, we create our chat language model again, and then we use AI services and say, okay, this is the model I want to use, and this is the extractor class that I want to use. And with that, Langchain basically feeds that person extraction with this user message, and then when you say extractor extract person and pass in the text, that goes to the LLM, and the LLM basically looks at the instructions and tries to figure out how to extract the information that you want and gives you a person object. So as an application developer, you are basically just saying extractor extract person as if you are calling a local function, but under the covers, like, it's going to the LLM and getting the information that you need, which is pretty cool. So if we um, run this, extract data. Hopefully, if it works, uh, you should see that you get a person, yeah, Anna and 23. So we got the strongly type object, and then we printed the, the name and the, the age of the person. Of course, you can do much more complicated things. Some of, some of the time it works, some of the time it doesn't work, so you need to change your prompt, you need to change your parameters and stuff like that, so you need to play with it, it's not perfect. But for but it's still pretty great in my opinion that you can kind of rely on LLM to, do, to look at your text and get the stuff that you need without you having to write the code all the time on how to extract that information. All right, so that's extracting information. Um, what else we can do? Um, there's something called prompt templates in Langchain. So prompt templates, they allow you to reuse prompts with different inputs. So for example, you can say here, uh, you, ha you can have a prompt template that says, you are a friendly chef l with a lot of cooking experience. Create a recipe for a dish with the following ingredients, ingredients, and give it a name. So this is a prompt template. And as you see, the dish and the ingredients are templatized, right? So you need to pass them in. And later, if you want to use this, you create a map and you pass in the dish, dessert, and you pass in the ingredients, strawberries, chocolate, and whipped cream. And then you apply the prompt template, you get a prompt, and then you can ask LLM, can you please um, give me, like, answer this question. So this allows you to basically use the same prompt for different kind of inputs. And if you run this, so prompt template, we should see that um, basically the, the template the prompt gets applied and then we should get a res recipe with the things that we specified. So you see you get a recipe with strawberry, swirl, chocolate, cream, or something like that. All right, so that's prompt templates. And now with prompt templates, you can do more. Um, again, this is another use case of uh, LLMs. You can use text classification. Let's say you want to classify certain things. Uh, you can use LLM for that. And, and you can use fifth shop prompting to do that. Fisher prompting means you give some examples to, to the LLM and say, okay, this is a positive example, this is a negative example, this is a neutral example. And then from there, LLM figures out how to classify things. And then you can uh, use that to classify, to do text classification. So for example, in this case, again, I'm building a chat language model. Then I'm defining a prompt template. And in this template, I say, analyze the sentiment of the text below respond only with one word to describe the sentiment, okay? So that's my text classification. Input is, this is fantastic news. Output is positive. Input is pi is roughly equal to 3.14. Output is neutral. And then input is, I really dislike pizza. Output is negative, right? So I'm giving some examples of what I mean by positive, neutral, and negative. And then I say, okay, what, given this text, what should be the output, right? 
and then I pass the text, I love strawberries, and then I'm expecting an answer from LLM. So I'm using prompt templates, but I'm also using few-shop prompting to get classifications. Um, if we run this, we should see what happens. And then, yeah, if we pass in I love strawberries, then, then we get the output pos positive, okay? So this was, um, let me see if I have anything else. Yeah, so this was a really quick summary of like what LLMs are useful for, how you can use them from Java, what libraries you can use, stuff like that. Next, I want to get into some more complicated examples. And the first one is um, on something called RAG, Retrieval Augmented Generation. Um, and one problem with LLMs is that they are trained with certain public data and they are trained up to a certain time. Um, for example, in, in Gemini, I think Gemini latest version is trained up until December 2023, something like that. And it's trained on public data, right? So if you want to ask any questions about your private data or any questions after Gen December 2023, it's not going to be able to answer, okay? So what do you do in that case? Uh, well, there's a few different things you can do. Uh, one of them is RAG. And the idea here is that you basically pass in your documents um, and, and let LLM use your documents to answer the questions that you want to be answered about your document, okay? And the way this works is that um, you have two phases in RAG. First is the ingestion phase. So let's say you have a number of documents that you want to include in your LLM. First, you split them into smaller chunks, okay? And then you pass them through LLM and create what's called vector embeddings. So this takes the text that you have, the small chunks, and then it creates a, a number representation of that text, okay? So that's what the vector embedding is. And then you have an LLM, a specialized LLM, that basically knows how to take the text and convert it into embeddings. Once you have that, you save that into a vector database, which is a specialized database that's, um, that's um, specialized for vector embeddings. And then the sec in the second phase, the user asks a question uh, to the LLM, right? So you take that prompt, you also calculate the embedding of the prompt. So that, that, that's also, there's also an embedding for the prompt. And then, you, then from that embedding, uh, you say, you ask the vector DB which chunks that I embedded are similar to what I'm asking. So we are, you do a simil similarity kind of search. And that's the thing about embeddings is that it captures the text as numbers. And then since it's numbers, you can see how similar they are. So from the prompt, you get similar um, documents or let's, I should say similar chunks. And then you feed that into LLM again, you, and you say, okay, this is the context of, of my question, this is the prompt, this is what the user asked, and these are the relevant chunks to that prompt. We, we, and we found these relevant chunks through the vector database. And with that information, then LLM can answer questions about your documents, okay? So you're kind of feeding your private documents to the LLM and giving it a better context so that it can answer questions that it's not trained on. That's the idea. And then at that point, you will have an answer that's much more accurate than you would have had if you didn't use Rack. So that's the idea of Rack and how you can do this in um, Langchain. And thankfully, Langchain has good, um, good um, building blocks for this. Um, so to show you this, first, um, in this case, I'm using this paper called Attention is All You Need, PDF. And let's say this is the, my private document. And this is not a good example because this, this um, paper is already public. So maybe the LLM is already trained on this. But let's assume that this, this paper is private, your private data. So if you want to ask questions about this PDF, what you need to do is first, you need to ingest that PDF, right? And then uh, this PDF is on, a, on our GitHub. So I just create a URL, then I have this thing called Apache PDF document parser, and then I point to that URL. So I'm basically reading that PDF. And then once we have the PDF, we need to embed, create vector embeddings for that PDF. 
So what I do is that I create a Vertex AI embedding model. So it's not a chat model anymore, it's an embedding model. Um, and I use this model, text embedding gecko. This is a model where it takes text and it converts into vector embeddings. There's a list of other models that you can use, but for this use case, this is the one that makes sense. So I'm using that. And then um, for the embedding store, so once I have the embeddings, I need to store them somewhere. So now for this demo, I'm storing them in memory again because I want things to be simple. But in a real world kind of application, you probably need to use some, something like um, Cloud SQL for Postgres or AlloyDB or some other database that uses, uh, that has support for web vector embeddings. But in this case, I'm just storing everything in, in memory. So that's why I have this in memory embedding store. And then you need to take your document and break into chunks. So here, what I'm doing is that, uh, again, this is lang chain having good defaults. So here we have document splitters that takes your document and splits into 500 uh, characters with 100 um, what's called um, over overlap. So each chunk has an overlap of 100. Now, these numbers are kind of magic. Like, why did I choose 500 instead of 1,000? Why did I choose 100? Like, there's no right answer here. You need to experiment and see which one get, gets you a better answer. Um, one thing to keep in mind is that your context size is limited. So you need to make sure that you're, you're not going over the context size. So you don't want this number to be too high, but you don't want, to, you don't want it to be too small either. So it's something like 500 characters seem OK here. So that's what I'm doing. Um, so this store ingester basically takes your document, puts it into 500 characters chunks, and then saves it to your vector database. In this case, it's just in-memory database. And then once I have that, I create my chat language model. So this is the regular um, model that I, that I created before. Then I create a retriever. Uh, retriever is the thing that I'm going to use to get this vector um, embeddings. So I'm pointing to my embedding store and my embedding model. And the rest is pretty much the same. So I create an interface. Um, I point to my model. And then I point to my content retriever. So I'm just basically bringing all of that together. And when I ask a question, um, so when I ask a question, so these are the questions I want to ask about my PDF. What neural network architecture can be used for language models? What are different components or transformer neural networks? So things that, that, that's in the PDF. So if I ask these questions, the Langchain will basically do the right thing, and it will kind of figure out all the details that I explained in the RAG uh, presentation. It will do all, all those, and it will give me the right documents and ask the right questions and send it to the LLM and get the answer, basically. So there's a lot of stuff that happens under the covers, but at the end of the day, if you just run, run this, it, it just works. Um, you just need to set the right things um, and the right, um, right vector stores and right splitting and all that kind of stuff. Uh, so now, as you see, we, we chunked and embedded our PDFs. And now we are answering questions about the, the PDF. Okay, So that's how you can do um, a simple RAG architecture in memory here. But again, as I said, like in a real world kind of application, you probably want not in memory, but a real vector database. So I'll kill this for now. So that's RAG. Um, another thing you can do is as I mentioned, LLMs, they don't have real-time data, right? So if you want to ask a question like, what's the weather like in Sofia? LLM is not going to know that because it's not trained today, right? But what you can do is uh, something called function calling. And the idea of function calling is that you ask the question, and then you send that question to, to LLM. But you also tell LLM, you have this um, function available to you if you want to call it. This function has the name get weather, and it takes a string as location, right? So you're basically telling the function, this is available to you if you want to call it. So when the LLM gets that um, prompt and the function, it will realize that, oh, this is a question about weather, and I have this function available. So can you call that function for me, please? It's not going to call it for you. It will ask you to call it. So it will say, can you call it for me, please? Then your application will make a call to an external place, get weather Sophia. Then it will get the response back, sunny. Then it will feed that back to LLM. Forecast is sunny. Then LLM at this point, it has a prompt and it has the actual information that it needed. How is the weather in Sophia today? Okay? And then it will respond back saying, okay, it's sunny in Sophia. Okay? 
So this is called function calling. It's a little bit weird because you need to kind of tell LLM this is the function you can call, but, I, but it won't call, so you have to call it on its behalf. But it kind of works in the end, uh, and you're basically augmenting LLM to, with information that it doesn't have. So how you do this in um, Langchain? Um, well, I'll show you the way I don't like first, and I'll show you the way I like. So the way I don't like is that first you create a chat language model like before, and then you create a, what's called a tool specification. So in this tool specification, you specify your function, the name of your function, the description of your function, and the parameters of your function. It's an open API spec. And this is important to get it right because um, you want to make this as descriptive as possible. You, you want to give it a good name so that LLM can figure out that this is a function I want to call. So once you have that, then you make a prompt and say, what is the weather in Paris? Um, and then, um, well, you, you pass this, um, when you do model generate, you not only pass your message, but you also pass in what's available to the LLM to call, in this case, the weather tool spec. And then the, the LLM will respond back saying, oh, I actually need to call this function. So this is the re response you will get. And from there, you have to call a function and get the weather. But in this case, I'm just faking and saying, OK, Paris is sunny. So we, we, get, we get the response and add it to the messages. And then we call generate again with my original message, with the response of the function call, and, uh, and then feed that back to LLM. And with that, LLM can answer the question in a natural kind of way. Okay? So it's a little bit tedious, but if you run it, um, you will see that um, there will be a request coming back from LLM. Can you please call this function here? And then eventually, when, once we provide the answer, it will say the weather in Paris is sunny with a temperature of 20 degrees. OK. So this is one way of doing it. Now, another way of doing this is let Langchain handle all of this for us. And again, this is why I like using Langchain, because it makes this much easier. So what you can do is that in Langchain, you create a record, weather for forecast, um, and then you say, OK, this, is, this weather forecast has a location, forecast, and temperature. Then you create a weather forecast service. Um, this is a service that will handle all this function calling for us. Uh, but the key thing is the, is the annotations. So here, first, we are saying this is a tool. Get the weather forecast for a location. So this will hint to the LLM that this is a tool that you can use to get weather. And the second thing uh, we do is that in the function signature, we add this P annotation. And this basically says this is a parameter, which is the location to get the forecast for. Okay? And this is another hint to the LLM to tell it that this is you need to pass an allocation. And then here, you would normally make the call to some service to get the, the uh, weather forecast. But here, we are faking it and just saying, OK, if location is Paris, just say sunny and 20. But basically, you just annotate the right parts of the service. And then later, what, what you need to do is that when you create your AI service, you pass in your weather assistant with annotations. You pass in your model. You pass in your chat memory, and you pass in your forecast service. So you basically bring all, all of that together. And then when you say, what is the weather in Paris, you're basically just asking a simple question to, the, to your interface. It will do all the work for you. It will call the LLM. LLM will respond back. It will get the response. So it will do all the work that I explained before automatically for you, um, which is much nicer way of running this, in my opinion. So if we run this function calling assistant, you will see that it basically will give us the same kind of response, but it's much nicer to use as an application developer. Like you just need to you just call a function and then you get a response, but everything is basically goes through the LLM. And if LLM needs to make a weather service call, that's done and ret returned to the LLM. So everything is under the covers basically. So it, it works. And um, lastly, you can also have multiple function calls. Um, so for example, let's say you have a currency converter that converts currency from one um, currency to another currency. So you can say, OK, this is a tool that converts between two currencies, and these are the parameters. Then maybe you have another tool that gets the stock price in US dollars. 
and then maybe you have another tool that says, given this amount, take the percentage of this amount, because LLMs are not great with math, but you can ha have tools to do the math. So if you have these three tools, then you can create this multi-tool, um, and then pass it to your LLM, and then you can ask questions like, what is the 10% of Apple stock converted from USD to Euro, right? So this is a question that you can ask, and it will use three tools to answer this. It will use um, one tool to get the stock, the other tool to convert that from USD to Euro, and the other tool to get the 10%. So if you run this, you will see that uh, it will work, and it will work because we have the right tools with the right annotations, and everything goes through the LLM, but you don't need to um, do much work yourself. So you see that the three calls we have, the stock price, apply percentage, convert currency, they are calls from LLM to functions, well, call requests, and all is done automatically. In the end, you will see this basically. 10% of Apple stock is basically 16.14. It's wrong, but like, yeah, you get the idea. All right, um, and lastly, I want to talk about open um, models. So as I mentioned, Gemma is the open model, the open version of Gemini. And you can use Gemma um, in something called Olama, which is kind of like Docker. Uh, you know, you, have, you can use Docker for containers. Well, Olama is kind of like Docker, but for models. So you can use it to pull models, and you can use it to run models locally. Um, and I, I will actually show you an example. So if you install um, Olama lo locally, then you can do this something like this, Olama pool, Gemma 2B. So this is a smaller version of Gemma. And let's actually run this. So when I do that, I'm basically pulling the Gemma um, locally on my machine. I already have it here. And then if I do like Olama list, just like Docker list, you ca I can see the models available to you, to me. So that's Gemma. And then I can do Olama run. And now I can run Gemma locally on my laptop. So now I'm, I'm going to run Gemma locally on my laptop. So this is Gemini kind of slimmed down version. And I can say, hello, how are you? And this is talking to the model on my laptop right now. Now it's responding to me, which is not bad. You know, you can still do some things with, with this model. So this is one way of, um, uh, oh, I need to write by, OK. This is one way of running uh, open models locally. But you probably don't want to assume that people have Olama and everything is stored properly. So what you want to do is, is probably something like this, where you use test containers um, to run Olama container that runs Gemma, basically. Okay. And the way this works is that the user asks a question. Um, yeah, one second. I don't know why my screen goes black once in a while, but I'll just wait for a second. But the idea here is that the user will ask a question, and then it will go to your container uh, running locally within test container, and it will go to Gemma, and then Gemma will answer, and then you'll basically answer to the, to the person. I won't run this. Uh, locally because Docker, um, I restarted my computer and Docker probably won't work. But just to show you the code, um, basically you create what's called a Olama container. Um, and then you pull Gemma on it. And then once you have it, you can, you, can, you can reuse it. And then when you run the code, you start the Olama container. And then you again create a chat language model. So it's, it's still the same thing, basically. You, you create a chat language model, but instead of pointing to a Google service, you're pointing to a Olama chat model, which is something, again, given by Langchain. But it, that points to an, a chat model on your host and, and your port running on your machine. And then you point to your model, and then you can ask a question, and it will answer uh, with just like any other uh, large language model. OK, um, I think that's all I have. So hopefully this was useful to you. Was, I know it's a lot of information. But as I mentioned, if you want um, these slides, they are on speaker deck. And if you want to run all of this, we have detailed instructions in this code lab link. Thanks very much for listening. I'm here for any questions that you have after the talk. So feel free to come and ask me. Thank you. <laughs>